Hello and a warm welcome to World Stories, your international reporter's magazine. I'm Sumi Somaskada. And on this edition, how the Mayans changed their looks for beauty and power without cosmetic surgery, what climate change and camel milk have in common in Kenya, and why a 10th century boat is drawing crowds in Kiev. All that and more coming up. But first to India, where a long-standing tradition is facing a major crisis. The circus used to be a highlight for everyone in India, from paupers to princes. According to legend, it all started when an Italian performer told an Indian royal horse trainer he couldn't build his own circus. That spawned the country's first performing troupe, the Great Indian Circus, and a fascination with the animals, tricks, and acrobatics that came along with it. But today, the magic has disappeared. Dwindling crowds and stricter laws are threatening to wipe India's circuses off the map. Christina Alsasser has more. The Rambo Circus at the edge of Mumbai. One might be forgiven for thinking this is a rehearsal, but it's not. Audiences are simply staying away. The performers spend months practicing acts few people want to come and see. The magic of the circus is fading. The day may soon come when children will be able to see circus performances only in archive footage. I've brought my children to see the circus because we don't know whether it will come back or whether they'll get to see it again. India's circuses are finding it hard to compete with newer types of entertainment. Children prefer computer games to tricks and acrobatic displays. Clowns no longer draw excited crowds. Many circuses have already closed up shop. India may there used to be about 300 circuses in India. Today, three or four decades later, there are only between 30 and 35 left. The few that are still going struggle with all kinds of problems. Diesel prices are climbing, the grounds they're allowed to use are far from city centers, and official support has dwindled. Traditional circus animals like lions, bears, and monkeys have disappeared from rings. An Indian Supreme Court ruling banned most wild animals from circuses, leaving only elephants. Animal welfare activists are happy, but many audience members miss the exotic acts. Laws limiting the work children are allowed to do have also been introduced. A necessary protection but a problem for circuses needing to train new talent. If the circus is going to survive, we need help from the government. For one, centrally located grounds must be made available to us. We'd also like a relaxation of the child labor laws so we can train more performers for the circus. And the authorities should reconsider the ban on shows that have wild animals. If the government doesn't do something, the circus in India is going to become history in the next 10 to 15 years. These days, few people are interested in a career in the circus. It's very difficult. Nobody wants to work in a circus nowadays. That's the reality. They say, why would we want to work in the circus? Even our own performers feel it would be better to go back and work in their villages. Many performers have left. An ordinary man can work as a laborer. He can earn a living working in the fields. But what about us? Can we just keep waiting for the government to help us? The Rambo Circus is doing what it can to survive. To try and entice audiences, it's introduced new artists from abroad. The Ring of Death is an act from Colombia. Through the internet, the circus director found another troupe of performers from Ethiopia. For now, they're glad to have the work. Yeah, it's better because if you see my country, there is a lot of artists such as me, but there is no big circuses like this, working, moving place to place and uh, just like the business. 
but it could prove to be a temporary gig. After a few days in Mumbai, it's time for the Rambo Circus to move on. Everyone here is well aware they may soon be performing for the last time. Thanks to Christina Alzasser for that story. Now, our appearance plays a large role in how we're perceived. That's something that's true in almost every society. Whether it's clothes, makeup, or even surgery, we often manipulate our appearances to meet certain standards of beauty, culture, and more. That's nothing new, though. In our next story, Norma Avila Jimenez from Mexico's Canal 22 shows us how even ancient Mayans used to artificially change the shape of their skulls to send a signal to the rest of society. Take a look. Chroniclers from the age of Spanish colonization surmised that deforming the skull served to give a warrior a fierce countenance in battle. Some of the skulls found show only a slight deformation, so they could have been normal variations of natural shapes. Some may have come from people who weren't subjected to the deformation procedure for long enough. But a forehead can be widened only so far by artificial means. To do that, the heads of newborn babies were subjected to extreme compression, a very painful procedure. Many of the Mayan figurines, reliefs, and frescoes depict people with flattened noses and foreheads, or stretched heads. But what motivated these efforts to change the skull's natural shape? This mysterious custom was not limited to Central American civilizations. Evidence of it has been found in South America, Africa, Asia, and Australia. Skull deformation often had a social significance and was reserved for the upper class, a kind of branding that signified membership of a clan or another group. In Yucatan, a connection has been found between a certain type of deformation, this flattened, sloping forehead, and the social status of the person. We've seen it, for example, in the frescoes of Yashchilan. Mothers subjected their babies to the procedure for at least three years, starting from early infancy. One reason may have been vanity. They may have been trying to achieve an aesthetically pleasing appearance and a distinctive look. The forehead or rear of the head was partly flattened using boards or they'd use tightly wound bandages to give the entire head an oblong shape. If they wanted to give it more of a cube shape, they might strap the child's head to its cradle to force it to grow in that direction. Experts believe the brain's normal functioning remained largely unaffected by this treatment. The true risk was a different one. Too much deformation could put so much pressure on the skull that it would crack. The result was higher child mortality. In 2002, Dr. Serrano and a team of specialists working in the Cenote Kanun sinkhole in Yucatan found the deformed skull of a woman. It shows the deformations typical of what we call a tabula erecta, a flattening of the back of the head, neck and the front of the forehead. That pushes the skull far out to the sides. It was the most widespread type of skull deformation, familiar from the pre-classic era, or from 1500 BC to the age of colonization. Skull deformations also appeared in depictions of Central American gods. Quetzalcoatl, for instance, who wore a cone-shaped hat. Or Siwatateo, who was believed to take in the spirits of women who had died in childbirth. Eventually, Catholic missionaries forbade the practice of skull deformation, possibly because they failed to see the beauty in it. Standards of beauty that continue to change. Now, happy cows make happy milk, so goes the saying. But milk doesn't just come from cows. In Kenya, for example, climate change has forced local communities to find a new source of nourishment. And camel milk is just the solution they needed. The drink has long been consumed across the Middle East, where it's known for its nutritional value and its medicinal properties. 
In Kenya, the production and selling of camel milk has created jobs, improved nutrition, and helped locals adapt to the changing climate. Reporter Holger Chechak has more. We're here at the source of Kenya's secret treasure, camel's milk. A camel produces roughly four liters of milk per day, and it's rapidly becoming the hope of a drought-stricken region. Donkeys carry the milk to collection points. From there, it's taken by pickup truck to the city. But where does it end up? The city of Iziolo is a four-hour drive north of the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. They drink camel's milk here because there's not enough grazing to keep cows. This area used to experience drought every five years. Now, it's every year, a consequence of climate change. The camels were the brainchild of Morgan Saloma of the Dutch development organization SNV. Better camel husbandry could mean less hunger for the local people. Saloma is helping these milk wholesalers improve production methods. New techniques have led to better hygiene. Adan Ali Mohammed has begun using a cloth to filter the wood charcoal out of the milk. It's an improvement on a traditional method of pasteurizing and preserving the milk. His efforts have paid off. I think a litre was 20 shillings when we started here. Yeah. At the moment, we are, we are selling a litre at, uh, at uh, 80 shillings. The milk is popular, especially in Nairobi. The price has gone up because of high demand. It's one day later, and this bus is headed to Nairobi. Unfiltered camel's milk isn't allowed on board. Enforcing that rule is this woman's job. She's from the Anole Women, a cooperative founded three years ago by the wives of camel owners. Their husbands are sometimes a bit sloppy with their milking. The women's goal is ensuring hygiene from the source to the buyer. It's a strategy that's expanded the customer base. In Nairobi, their reputation for high standards is well known. In this way, the women of the Camel Milk Cooperative are also earning more. The group has grown to 60 members, and they're saving up for a truck and a shared dairy. But there are new worries. Business is good, but for two years our neighborhood has been unsafe. People from other places are robbing our grazing grounds, killing our herdsmen, and stealing our camels. Climate change brought drought, and with it tribal feuds over grazing land. The herders in Iziolo drive out to their camels only with armed protection. 60 kilometers out, it's not safe. Even we can't go here without a security detail. Shepherds, many of them still children, wander about with their herds. Their lives as herders seem predestined. They don't attend school. Mohammed Shinoy is one example. He began shepherding when he was 10 years old. Now he's 45. His camel's milk goes to Nairobi, but he doesn't want to follow it. I don't know anything about city life. How am I supposed to survive there? Out here I have everything. I'm used to nature, and there's always something to eat. Keeping camels is one way to overcome drought. People without camels need feed for cows. That's virtually impossible without farming. In Andonyuro, far off the beaten track, Farming was an unknown word until quite recently. The people of the Samburo tribe of northern Kenya believe God provides feed for cows. It either grows or it doesn't. Now these children are learning that food can be planted. Hunger is preventable. Their mothers are showing them how. They learned from Dutch aid workers who taught them to plant fast-growing grass. Today they're harvesting for the first time in their lives. This project makes us hopeful. During a drought, we usually can't do anything. But now we can grow our own food, 
feed our cattle, earn something, and send our kids to school. Those who sow shall reap. That's the logic behind the project. And it's promoting peace in northern Kenya. Camels are a promising sign of what the future may hold. But back to the present. German Holger Marbach was a development worker for 15 years. Now he runs a camel milk plant in Nanyuki, 70 kilometers southwest of Iziolo. His company, Vital Camel Milk, already supplies major supermarkets. Iziolo has some way to go before it will be producing camel's milk that's up to European drinking standards. But Marbach has branched out into skincare products, and he's interested in cooperating with Morgan Saloma's wholesalers. We've just started delivering a new product. We're bringing our Malaika healing cream into supermarkets. We could use your camel milk for that, and your people could sell a lot more. The medicinal properties of camel's milk make it especially valuable. The women of the camel's milk cooperative will be pleased at a chance to reap new profits. Eastly, Nairobi. The bus carrying the camel's milk has arrived at the Somali slum, nicknamed Little Mogadishu. It's the biggest market for the camel's milk produced in Iziolo. Most of the milk is snapped up quickly by local people for domestic use and by restaurant owners. It seems the road to a product that's hygienic and durable enough for export will be a long and bumpy one. Well, the European Union has already approved imports of camel milk from other producers, so it could soon take off here too. Well, from Nairobi, we go to Kiev. The Ukrainian capital has just added a new attraction to its list of sites, a boat. But not just any boat. This one, called Prince Vladimir, has been built the same way it would have been centuries ago. And it's helping Ukrainians pay homage to their history and heritage. TVI's Yulia Kutsenko sent this report. A long ship from a bygone age has returned to Kiev. Boats like these were widely used in the 10th and 11th centuries in the medieval territory of Kiev and Rus for diplomatic and military expeditions. Historians and engineers managed to recreate this boat based on old representations. Just like the original, this one is largely made of pine wood. About 10% of it is oak and lime. The parts have been glued together using a fish oil-based adhesive similar to what would have been used 1,000 years ago. The long ship is set to become a central attraction at Kiev and Rus's cultural and historical theme park. We're proud to present our reconstructed warship, Prince Vladimir, as it was in the 10th century. This is the kind of boat our forefathers traveled in, to find out about other people and other countries. It was the main transport used in war, trade and diplomacy. A long ship like this one would have been crewed by 17 people. Despite its small size, it was not easy to sail. Usually half the crew rode for an hour while the others rested. Then they traded places. Back then, people were more used to hard physical labor. Their descendants are definitely not. With its modern crew, Prince Vladimir can only manage speeds of five to six kilometers per hour. But thanks to their enthusiasm, the long ship has managed to traverse the long distances between the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean in just a few months. 
We've covered thousands of kilometers from the Baltic Sea and the Vistula and the Dnieper rivers to Istanbul and the Volga. On some parts of the route, we had to heave our boat on a rope like in medieval times. We only used modern equipment in the most severe storms, but we still managed to retrace all the sea routes of our forefathers. The Kiev and Rus Park will be the longship's final resting place. The boat's arrival here drew a big crowd. Prince Vladimir will not be the only historical boat here for long, though. Historians and engineers are planning to reconstruct an entire medieval fleet. For many local residents, Prince Vladimir's homecoming was an emotional spectacle and a source of great pride. A lot of people argue about whose forefathers go back furthest. I don't know a lot about the historical period, but one thing's for sure, this shows that our ancestors were just as strong and clever as everyone else's. The longship will be a welcome addition to the Kiev and Rus Park's replica medieval town, where visitors mingle happily with reenactors dressed in authentic costume. Our final stop of the day takes us to the Saudi city of Jeddah, where we visit the country's first center for the blind. The Qatar Center provides a recreational space where the vision impaired can take part in sports and educational activities, share ideas and experiences, and support one another. Alan's Adnan Mispa brings us this story. The blind have many of the same needs as the sighted. That includes the need for facilities where they can pursue leisure time interests and activities. One such place is the Qatar Center. It's the first of its kind in Saudi Arabia. The center is short-staffed, and it lacks equipment, but many blind people come here to have fun and to feel at ease. The budget approved by the Ministry of Social Affairs is around 8,000 euros, but the rent is 12,000. Added to that are expenses for personnel who take part in special programs. So we have to cover our expenses through donations. We've created an environment that's suitable for blind people. We've set up a computer room, for example. But the swimming pool needs renovating. We need pumps to do that. For this game, the players depend on their quick reactions to sounds and motion. The ball contains a bell. The two teams of three players each pass it back and forth across the floor and try to score goals. Majad al-Barakati has proved to be a talented player. I'm so happy to be in a sports hall that's not in a school or a university. There are hardly any recreational activities for blind people. We really needed a center like this one here in Jidda. All the more so because the number of blind people in the city is relatively high. With its relaxed atmosphere and social and sporting opportunities, the Qatar Center has enriched the lives of many local blind people. Well, that's all for this week's edition of World Stories. From us, our reporters, and partner stations around the world, thanks for watching. To watch more episodes, head to our website. That's dw.de forward slash world stories. We'll leave you with this week's Picks of the World. See you next time with more World Stories. Thank you.